Rob Satloff, thank you very much for joining us today at our annual leadership forum. We very much appreciate it. Um, I'd like to um, begin with uh, perhaps the most vexing issue, at least from our perspective, and that would be Iran. Um, it seems with the street protests now throughout Iran uh, and uh, the um, revelation of the sale of thousands of drones by the Iranians to the Russians, that the JCPOA seems to have been put off a little bit to the side, if not to the side. Question is, is it there permanently? Um, is in several months, do you expect this to be revived? Uh, where is the path from here, do you think? Well, first of all, Dan, it's a pleasure to be with you and everyone uh, connected to B'nai B'rith. I have uh, a very a warm spot in my heart for B'nai B'rith, and I'm very happy to do anything I can to advance your mission. You. Um, Iran, very important, lots happening. Uh, it, it's I think it's useful to unpack your question a little bit because there's different pieces of what's going on. Uh, my own view, first of all, is um, um, what's going on in Iran is bigger than street protests. Um, it's it's it, We've probably passed the characterization of it as a um, as a, a revolt, and it is now somewhere approaching revolution. And will it succeed? I don't know, but it is it is um, sustained. I mean, it's now three months. Um, it is nationwide. Um, it is not just in the periphery. It is not just in the handful of major cities. It is almost everywhere, um, and it is um, uh, broad based. It's uh, men and women and workers and students and people from lots of different parts of society. This is serious. And the regime has yet to figure out quite how to respond. Um, uh, early on, it, you know, there were wayward youth. More recently, um, the, um, the leadership of uh, the Islamic uh, regime refers to them now as the enemy of the people of Iran. Well, if they're the enemy, then the regime is in trouble because um, this enemy is pretty broad-based, uh, numerous, um, and the regime has not figured out um, uh, how to even use force to stop hundreds of thousands of young women, let alone all the young men involved. And this touches the heart of Iranian society. It is real, it is lasting, and it will have a huge impact. Um, so that's, I think, the context. Now, you asked me about the JCPOA. The uh, the um, the Iran nuclear deal, um, uh, and just to remind our uh, attendees, um, Joe Biden came to office, um, committed um, publicly. It was the only op-ed he wrote on foreign policy during his campaign was on Iran, in which he said, "You know, I was no great fan of the Iran nuclear deal, basically, but this is the best way, in his view, to stop Iran's nuclear progress." And he was committed to renewing it after Donald Trump had um, taken America out of the deal. Uh, so that's what he came to office with. Um, uh, and yet here we are almost two years later and we and it hasn't been renewed. Um, uh, why? Ultimately, it's because the Iranians said no. Um, you would think the Iranians would say yes, the deal, in my view, um, uh, uh, is very much in Iran's favor, but uh, the Iranians want more. The Iranians wanted even more sanctions relief, faster, more cash, um, fewer American restrictions. They wanted more. Um, uh, uh, and even for an administration committed to doing a deal, it had its limits. And it would not um, say yes to everything the Iranians asked. Now, uh, uh, given the revolt going on in Iran, uh, the administration has... Um, uh, temporarily, at least, removed this diplomacy from the table. It's not active anymore, it says. The Iranians aren't pursuing it, and we're not pursuing it. Of course, the Iranians are continuing to pursue their nuclear program. And in fact, it just recently announced um, another big step up, um, expanding the, um, uh, the, the number of uh, advanced centrifuges that are operating, uh, expanding the amount of 60% enriched uranium it is collecting. Um, uh, this is just 
um, a hop, skip, and a jump away from military grade weapons level uranium. Um, and so this is an extremely dangerous situation. But the diplomacy, as you suggested, Dan, is currently on hold. Um, the real question is, uh, if the Iranian regime were to wake up tomorrow and to call up the White House and say, remember that deal you put on the table six months ago that we said no to? Well, we've changed our mind. We'd like to take it. Um, why would they do that? Not because the deal is any better, but because they know that a nuclear deal today would mark the end of the civil unrest. It would mark the end of this nationwide revolt because it would it would mean that the world's powers would be shaking hands with the leaders of Iran, sending them enormous sums, ending their isolation, and it would be a huge blow to the young men and women um, taking to the streets and campuses of Iran uh, calling for freedom. It would mark the end of the revolt. Um, uh, that's why the Iranians would do it. They haven't done it. And the question really is, if they did it, would Joe Biden and the American administration say, OK, um, there's a real debate about this right now. Um, some people say that, you know, it is so important to the American administration to find at least a, um, um, a temporary palliative solution to Iran's um, uh, uh, march toward a nuclear weapon that it would say yes. Other people say that the politics is so fraught right now that even a democratic administration would still would say no. My instinct is that it would be very difficult for a democratic administration to turn down an Iranian offer to accept, the, to accept a nuclear deal on terms that the United States themselves proposed. Um, so from my perspective, Thankfully, the Iranians um, haven't uh, um, had the wisdom of um, figuring out that this is a solution to their very difficult domestic problem. Well, let's go back to, to 2015 or even the run up to 2015, which is when the JCPOA was agreed upon. You know, the suggestion was made at the time, a number of people, if you're sitting down to talk about nuclear, why don't you have three baskets? Because Iranian malign behavior whether it's support for terrorist organizations, its proxies in Iraq, in Yemen, Hezbollah, of course, the relationship in Gaza, all of that support for terror. And then another basket would be human rights violations because they're among the biggest human rights abusers of juvenile offenders and LGBTQ women, um, political opponents, the Baha'i faith and so forth. So if you're gonna do this, you know, to, to compartmentalize, everybody understands nuclear, very most important. But we've noticed you know, over the last seven years that it's the, in the area of the malign behavior that the Iranian problem, uh, in terms of hegemonism, for example, in the region, has grown. Um, is, is there any thinking now about trying to rectify those mistakes, or is it, if, if it, it's decided that we're gonna, they are going to go back, they, whoever those are, the P5 plus one, go back into a negotiation that this will be kind of business as usual, leaving aside those two other baskets. So there was a time, a brief moment, Dan, that um, uh, it was the policy of the United States government to uh, insist that the next phase of Iran negotiations um, 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 have as its aim a longer, stronger agreement um, uh, that the diplomacy would be not just to renew the deal uh, from which Donald Trump extricated the United States um, uh, four years ago, but it would refashion the deal to um, uh, in two directions. One, longer, so that the sunset clauses, the dates by which Iran can can begin to do what is currently prohibited things, whether it's enrichment or um, um, uh, uh, metallurgy or various things that are restricted under the agreement, would be stretched out over a much longer period of time, and then stronger by expanding the items that the deal would um, uh, uh, would focus on, such as the ones you talked about. Now, normally, um, stronger meant 
uh, a way to address Iran's regional behavior and its ballistic missile program. Um, I think you're absolutely spot on to suggest that there are other things which should be included as well, such as Iran's egregious human rights um, record. Um, now, that was a moment in time. Somewhere over the past year, the Biden administration dropped that. They dropped it because the Iranians just said no. It's sort of like Nancy Reagan's, uh, the ghost of Nancy Reagan returned in different form to convince the Iranians to just say no. The Iranians said no, no longer, no stronger, and the administration backed down. Um, uh, why? Because its core objective remained the renewal of the JCPOA so as to be able to um, find a near-term solution for this massive headache that Iran is essentially a threshold nuclear state. And the administration is, is keenly, keenly eager to avoid you know, the military option. And so diplomacy, even a, faulted, a faulty diplomacy, a flawed diplomacy, a diplomacy which doesn't solve the problem, but at best kicks it a bit down the road and only some of it, not all of it. So some people in the administration, it's good enough. And that's where we are. Well, let's move to uh, a positive vector in the region. Uh, back in September, we observed uh, the second anniversary of the Abraham Accords, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, the relationship with Israel, the normalization with Morocco. Um, where do you see the Accords now? Uh, and it's new administration now, uh, and there will be a new Israeli government, although with the same leadership as there was a couple of years ago uh, in the first round of the Abraham Accords. Where do you see this moving? And do you, do you see the next steps, if this succeeds, um, to go outside, let's say, the Middle East region or with Arab countries and into the Islamic world? I'm thinking of Indonesia, for example. So what direction is this going to take? Yeah, it's a very good question. Well, first of all, um, uh, you know, it's important, it's important not to take where we are in the Middle East for granted. So a lot of people, you know, it's, uh, we, we, we just marked the 75th anniversary of uh, the partition resolution, yeah. um, a resolution in which um, uh, every Arab state um, opposed Israel's existence. Um, and, uh, you know, within um, um, uh, minutes of Israel's uh, uh, de declaration of independence. Um, several months later, um, uh, uh, you know, five Arab states launched an invasion to um, to snuff out this uh, this new Jewish state. Um, that, you know, seventy five years is a blink in, in the historical eye, um, and yet, you know, we are now in a situation where more than half of all Arabs live in countries at full peace with Israel. Uh, full, normal, peaceful relations with Israel. Um, and a large share of the other Arabs um, live in failed states, be it Syria, Yemen, Libya, et cetera, countries which you really wouldn't want to have peace with right now anyway. So the countries that um, uh, are you know, serious, um, solid states with whom Israel doesn't yet have full, normal, peaceful relations are, are a minority in the Middle East. And the, and the and and their people, their populations represent, you know, a, a, just a fraction of of the Middle East. This is a different era, um, so we should, you know, we should pinch ourselves a little bit um, uh, to recognize what has really happened. This is huge, um, uh, and and you know, it's. I, I urge everyone to just recognize the enormity of this change. Um, uh, the Abraham Accords has developed um, uh, bilateral relations that are strong, remarkably strong, between uh, Israel and then respectively um, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, especially. Um, uh, they compete with each other in terms of, you know, how they can um, have the deeper, more profound set of relations. So one of them will, will have a, um, a, a defense and security agreement, while the other will reach a free trade agreement. And they're, they're jumping over each other with enthusiasm to build um, uh, as deep a relationship with Israel as they can, um, uh, which is remarkable because the United States plays only a certain 
you know, increasingly marginal role in the growth of that bilateral relationship. We were we were essential to the birth, but we're becoming less essential to the maturity of these relations, which is the way it ought to be, which is exactly the way it ought to be. Um, there's also regional um, integration. Um, uh, the Bennett Lapid government in Israel took a, a different approach than the Netanyahu government and tried to build a set of regional institutions based on the normalization in the Abraham Accords. I'm referring to the Negev summit process, which um, uh, brought all the countries at peace with Israel together with the Americans, created six working groups on regional security and food security and energy and economics and, and, and all that sort of technical stuff, not very sexy, but yet it's the stuff of relationships. And it's the stuff that will build partnerships over time. Um, it's a, it's an interesting question whether whether the Netanyahu government will follow that model or take a different path. Historically, Netanyahu is less eager to or has has you know has less um, focus on the uh, the bureaucratic makeup of regional cooperation, working groups, and this is and that, and is much more eager to do what I'll call Gulf Stream diplomacy, getting in, you know, a little Gulf Stream plane and flying off um, uh, late one night to go meet with this leader or that leader and to do an important deal, be it on economics or on military or diplomacy. Um, we'll see whether or not he has the inclination to, to, to build out um, based on the Negev model, or he wants to do more of the um, uh, the Lone Ranger type of um, stuff, which helped build the original Abraham Accords. Um, you, you, you. Um, uh, he has said that his next big goal is Saudi Arabia, the uh, you know the cherry on the cake, if you will, of of all Arab um, states uh, with whom Israel desires to have normal, peaceful relations and full normalization. I think it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, than he has seen with other Arab states. Um, uh, uh, I just returned from a um, uh, my second trip to Saudi Arabia this year, and I am, you know, deeply impressed by the extent of of domestic reform and transformation going on inside the country. Um, on this issue, uh, uh, my my observation is, you know, the Saudis just have so much on their plate. They are doing now what some of the other Arab countries have done over the last 20 years. So they're dealing with issues like the role of women in society, the right, the right role of, of religion in society. Um, uh, uh, they're, they're still dealing, grappling with these basic issues that other countries like UAE or Morocco or whatever, you know, more or less answered over the last generation. And so for the Saudis, um, the Israel question while important, and they recognize the attraction of having um, uh, relations with Israel, um, it's it's relatively less urgent given everything else that they have on their plate. And so I, I think that the Israelis are likely, I, it's not impossible, but they're not likely to see as speedy a, um, a normalization with the Saudis as, uh, as many of them uh, would have liked. Um, uh, you mentioned other countries. Um, uh, we know that, for example, Azerbaijan, um, full steam ahead, just set up a an embassy in Israel. Um, this is a major Central Asian um, Shi majority uh, Muslim country. It's with uh, strategic relationships with the state of Israel. Very important potential partner. And there may be others further afield. Um, you referred to Indonesia. Uh, this very um, very sensitive domestic political um, issues going on in Indonesia right now. I'm not so sure that that they're ready yet for the full public embrace with Israel, but I think incrementally there's a real possibility that there will be some progress there. And and if I look around the globe, I'm you know there are others. Um, Oman, for example, is very important. Um, uh, uh, if the Israelis want to take full advantage of a Saudi um, uh, uh, concession which was to allow full overflight of Saudi territory. Um, it only makes sense. The Israelis can only exploit that 
um, if the Omanis agree, um, given the way the geography works, um, uh, you need to have an understanding with Oman as well as with Saudi Arabia. So I think focusing on Oman is a is a high Israeli priority as well. So there are others out there that they're that they're keen to pursue, and and um, uh, uh, you know Netanyahu has certainly has a track record of of uh, opening up some of these countries, and I think we're going to see quite a lot of effort in that regard. I'd like to move to an area you know really well, uh, North Africa. Um, we talked about Morocco and the relationship that it has with Israel, which really kind of, it transcends just a simple normalization document that is signed. Of course, the, the ties in terms of the large number of uh, Israelis of Moroccan origin and Moroccan Jewish history and history during the war, which you've written about, uh, extremely important ties there, which led ultimately to this relationship, or even we could we could talk, I suppose, at, at some point, maybe another time, about the, the role that Morocco played in the in the lead up to the um, peace treaty with, with Egypt. Uh, but uh, I'm thinking now of Libya, which which seems to be this this open sore that has attracted um, all kinds of, of, of foreign players um, in another, um, if not a great power grab, then kind of a regional power grab. Tell us about what you what you think is going on there. Yeah, Libya is a microcosm of a mess. Um, um, you're absolutely right to point out that um, it is uh, a, 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 a setting for almost every regional and global player that that has ambitions, you know, has has put their flag in Libyan soil. So the Russians are in Libya, um, principally through um, the Wagner group of mercenaries. Um, uh, the uh, um, uh, you know we the United States, we for better or for worse, we we lowered our direct engagement. Um, uh, one could argue we lowered it too soon. After uh, the overthrow of Gaddafi, and, and that helped over uh, helped open up um, the playing field to so many other actors. But there, are, the, the Emiratis are there, the Turks are there, the Egyptians are there, um, the the Europeans have a have a keen interest in Libya, given uh, Libya's role both as a source of migration to Europe and as a transit point for um, uh, uh, African uh, and Sahel migration to Europe. Um, so lots of players are, are active in Libya. Um, and it is divided. You know, Libya is a is a country that is uh, deeply divided tribally, geographically, economically, as well as politically. You know, frankly, right now the the, the big in, America's big interest in Libya is um, to have you know a semblance of a of an authority which which has control over Libya's borders um, to limit um, um, uh, immigration out. And passage out as a transit point uh, to Europe um, uh, to to limit this as a way station for for um, uh, violent groups and terrorists um, who use um, ungoverned spaces as havens. Um, and right now, there's you know there's a growth of of radical groups throughout the Sahel, um, um, often funneling through Libya where weapons are aplenty. Um, uh, Libya is a is, is a mess. This is one of these problems from hell um, uh, that uh, you know one wants to insulate in the the best. I, I don't know enough about the internal dynamics to say much more than uh, you know insulating Libya from infecting other countries around it um, is, I think, a very high priority for us. Talking about failed states, um, I'd like to talk about Lebanon, uh, which you know we we said many many decades ago after the um, Egyptian peace treaty with Israel. We said the second state to establish relations with Israel would be Lebanon. That was an assumption. It was a mistaken assumption that many many of us made at, at that time. But to bring it current, we've just seen, uh, we've got a couple of things going on. You've got coming up a big anniversary, I think, of Hezbollah uh, in, in Lebanon. I think it's, it's something like 40 years. Um, which has this its, its tentacles around around Lebanon. I mean, I sometimes refer to um, Lebanon as part of Iran Inc. Um, in terms of, of Iran's influence. And then 
you had this negotiation over the demarcation of territorial waters between Lebanon and Israel relating to gas uh, fields. Um, and the Lebanon agreement was seen as being a big plus because it would give Lebanon some kind of economic uh, hope uh, to turn things around in that in that failed uh, economy that it very much failed economy that it has. What do you see as as being next steps in Lebanon, let's say over the next year as we look ahead? Yeah. Um, you know, Lebanon is a is a tragic failed country. Um, uh, failed, especially because of the Iranian role and the Hezbollah stranglehold over politics, um, um, which overlays a you know a, a a a a corrupt political class of truly immense proportions. I mean, it's it's it, it's as though you know Bernie Madoff ran every arm of the Lebanese government. The 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 executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the Federal Reserve, every ministry, everyone was running a Ponzi scheme, and the government, the entire banking and financial system of the country finally collapsed. That's what has happened in Lebanon, where the value of the Lebanese lira um, uh, um, went from you know fifteen hundred to a dollar to forty thousand to a dollar. It has virtually no value. Everyone's savings disappeared because the banks were all robbed. I mean, it's 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 tough to put your hands around exactly what happened in this country that is so rich in beauty and and uh, human resources, human capital, et cetera. Um, uh, I, I mean, they have no president right now. They have no functioning government. There's a caretaker of a caretaker government. There's there's a constitutional vacuum. They have no functioning financial system. Um, uh, the place the, the place is basically collapsed. Now it's in this context that they did the maritime deal, not because the Lebanese are going to get any money anytime soon. There is no confirmation at all that the the portion of the demarcated um, uh, a maritime zone. That uh, uh, that Lebanon, um, over which Lebanon now has control, there's no indication that it has even a drop of natural gas. That's all yet tilt to be determined. But um, uh, they uh, they agreed to this deal with Israel to send a sign that 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 something's still functioning. Please don't accuse us of 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 collapsing the entire country. Um, uh, uh, it doesn't change one iota the situation inside Lebanon, except it takes um, uh, Israel's natural uh, gas field in the eastern Mediterranean off the Hezbollah target list. Hezbollah still has lots of other Israeli targets on their target list. And if there is a conflict, which Hezbollah doesn't want right now, because Hezbollah is still broken from its deep investment in helping Bashar al-Assad uh, destroy his own people and stay in power. But if Hezbollah were to go to conflict with Israel on Iran's orders, there, it has a lot of Israeli targets for its 100,000-plus uh, rockets. Um, uh, it's just not the maritime target. That's what they agreed to. I, I personally think it's a, it's, a, it's a good deal. It's not a huge game changer, um, but it's... It, it, it's, it, I think it's good for Israel. Um, and if it takes the, um, uh, the natural gas um, platforms off Hezbollah's target list in exchange for, um, a, you know, some hypothetical um, uh, natural gas, which may or may not exist on the Lebanese side of the maritime border, I think it's a reasonable, it's a perfectly reasonable deal. The Israelis didn't give up anything. Um, um, uh, so, um, but I, I wouldn't want to exaggerate this. This is not a game changer for the Lebanese economy. It's not a. It's, it's not a mark that Hezbollah has suddenly become, you know, members of uh, B'nai B'rith. Um, uh, by no means, um, they are who they are. Uh, not least because Iran tells them who they are, and that remains the dominant reality, sadly, for the people of Lebanon today. Uh, final question. Uh, let's go back 
to the Abraham Accords, but only for the connection that I'm going to make. You know, I, I think when I, when I used to think of the Palestinian issue, you know, you'd think of a, um, one of those boards at Penn Station or Union Station in the, in the pre-digital era where these, these destinations would change as the trains left the station. But the, the Palestinian issue always remained at the, at the top. Like that train was always going to leave, you know, on time. And, and no other train could leave until, until that issue was resolved, until the Palestinian issue, that train left the station. Well, Abraham Accords come along, uh, as you've said, and you've, you've laid it out. I don't think it's because necessarily these countries that have signed on have abandoned the Palestinians per se. But I think they're saying, we can't wait for you. We can't wait for you. Um, we've got our own trains to leave on. We've got our own agenda. We've got security issues. We've got economic issues. We've got investment issues in the region, um, et cetera. So we're just going to move, move along. Palestinians are still there. It's zero sum. Are they going to recognize Israel as a Jewish state? Well, you know, that's very equivocal. I mean, I remember being in one meeting with Abu Mazen where somebody asked him, will you recognize Israel as a Jewish state? And then he said, shrug his shoulders and say, Israel can call itself whatever it wants. Um, and then there's the refugee issue, the right of return issue. Where do you see this going in light of the fact that all of these other arrangements, this normalization is taking place apace? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think you... I think you correctly pointed out that um, the real innovation in the Abraham Accords is that Arab states are finally acting in their own state interest, their own national interest, and they're not letting the Palestinian issue hamstring the pursuit of their own national interest. And it doesn't mean that you're right to say it doesn't mean that they are indifferent to the fate of the Palestinians. Many of them still provide significant sums and, and significant support um, to Palestinian, both the, the, uh, the, 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 the authority as well as to Palestinian civil and religious institutions, but they aren't going to let themselves be, um, be handcuffed by the lack of progress between Israelis and Palestinians when they have to provide for their own people. Um, now, one might think that this would uh, uh, this would be a incentive for Palestinians to themselves um, speed up uh, their own train, um, as it were, and and uh, and 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 pursue a more uh, constructive uh, peacemaking um, with Israel. Uh, regrettably, that's not happening. The Palestinian Authority is instead choosing a very different path the international path, going to the International Court of Justice, going to the Human Rights Council, um, uh, confrontational. Um, uh, um, it will achieve nothing in the end, um, and it will extend um, the Israeli control, um, um, and, and it will not lead to a, you know, a diplomatic uh, resolution of this conflict. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a loosening of um, economic restrictions. There is, um, uh, you know, tens of thousands more Palestinians coming to Israel to work every day. Um, there's a lot more um, economic uh, um, uh, exchange going on. The Israelis even have a, a system that that allows thousands of Gazans to come into Israel as a relief valve, um, which has helped keep the confrontation with Hamas in Gaza. I mean, I hate to say acceptable levels, but within certain limits. Um, uh, my own view is um, uh, we're unlikely to see any diplomatic progress with either the current Palestinian political leadership or to be, uh, to be fair or with the incoming Israeli political leadership. Um, neither really sees it in its interest to pursue um, the rigorous uh, give and take of diplomacy that will require each of them to turn to their own peoples and say, um, uh, we need to make much more significant uh, compromises than we have been willing to make so far. Um, and until there is a change in, in leadership, um, either the mindset of leaders or the people of the leaders that, um, uh, that, that, that gives them the, uh, the, the strength and um, the uh, the constancy to be able to say to their own people, you know, we need to make compromises. 
um, uh, significant compromises. Um, uh, 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 we need to recognize the full legitimacy, at least of the claims of the other side. Um, uh, not that we have to agree with them, but we have to recognize at least the claims so that we can negotiate something because ultimately um, only, a lasting agreement is, is really is, has only one criteria, and that is that it is accepted by both sides. Um, uh, and until then, we will have, I think, more of what we have now which is an uneasy um, uh, status quo, but one which is remarkably satisfactory for a lot of people. We should not forget. Um, we, um, just this past September, marked the 29th anniversary of the Oslo Accords. 29 years in which there's a Palestinian authority um, that um, established by diplomatic agreement between Israel and the PLO that controls the civil life of the vast majority of Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, uh, that is, you know, for better or for worse, that is a remarkable achievement. It's not peace, but it is not war. And we should do everything we can to sustain it in the hopes that eventually it can blossom into something better but certainly not collapse into something worse. Well, Rob, thank you for this uh, tour d'horizon of uh, the Middle East's uh, geopolitical landscape. Uh, we deeply appreciate it. We deeply appreciate all the work that you do, all the work that the Washington Institute does. For those who follow these kinds of events closely, uh, the Washington Institute is so important in terms of helping so many of us to understand these, these issues uh, in depth. And, Again, we appreciate your being with us today. Pleasure to be with you, Dan. Thank you.